Okay, what's going on, everybody? Um, like a few days ago or two days ago, something like that, I uploaded a video titled On the Backs of Gods of the Board Game? Question mark. Um, with uh, kind of my ramblings of an epiphany that I had had that day about a board game based on my non-copyrighted, non-patented, anything on the Backs of Gods setting. And, um, I got a, I got a, a few comments about that, and I've been talking to Ziggy about it, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about that, and, um, I'm feeling pretty good about it. Um, I have started, I have Photoshop open right now, I've started some design work, I've been just thoughts everywhere about how this is working, and so I thought maybe I could do like a designer diary type thing a video diary of uh, my thoughts as this kind of whole thing evolves and comes about. Not saying it ever will come about, but maybe this will maybe this will help if I have all this just out there. <sighs> okay. So in the in that video in that first video I said I talked a bit about worker placement. And I was like I was set on worker placement. That seems like a good mechanic. Because this is going to be like area control-ish, but with worker placement involved. And, you know, you don't really have access to maybe all the spots equally. Like, you know, a lot of worker placement games. And so I was I was happy with worker placement. And then I was talking to, I was talking to Ziggy about victory conditions. Because that was really a big spot where I was kind of hung up. It was like, how do you win? How do you win the game? And so in that video, I was talking about, you know, different, like maybe there are different tiers of victory conditions so you need a certain amount of ore and a certain amount of lumber and you need to have you know you know all sorts of different stuff but it was just like and he brought up a victory condition of because he hadn't watched that video and he was like um if you have 12 or more ore income at the start or end of your turn flip over this card and you win and i was like well i don't we don't have income because that's not really a thing with the worker placement. It's you, you get a certain amount when you place your worker there. So there's no income. I'd have to get rid of worker placement to have that. And so I kind of dismissed it. But then I really started to think about it. I was like, huh. Maybe worker placement isn't the way to go. And so then I started thinking. And now, where we're at now, worker placement's gone. It's done. Let's get rid of it. Well, it's not completely gone, but it's kind of gone. Um, it's mostly gone. <laughs> So now we have a um, a component known as well. Right now it's called population. And so, based on your starting walker, you have a certain number of population that you start with. And these are just probably going to be like little cubes. Um, just like I'm probably going to for prototype testing, I'm just going to take the little cubes from like Lords of Waterdeep. Okay, and so if you start on, say, Gaia, you get you start with three population because it's not a very populated one. Or if you start on, like, Lagos, you get, like, five or something like that. Maybe six, who knows. And so your population on each walker determines the benefits that you get every round or maybe just, you know, constantly if you have that population. And so I'm going to bring up here for you to look at the... Uh, the design document that I have for the the walkers. I have three walkers set up right now, and right now they're gonna look very busy. The like the the walker tile looks very very busy. Um, but as I'll talk about later, we're gonna remove some of this, and once everything gets more finalized, and I come up with some iconography, I think we'll be able to kind of simple sim simplify it all a lot. But okay, just look at let's look at Gaia. And, okay, so you look at Gaia, and I think for the final version, there'll be, like, in the background, like, faded out. There'll be, like, a, pi a big picture of Gaia, so we can, you know, some gorgeous artwork and stuff. So, so you got Gaia, then you have the starting population. For Gaia, it's three. So when if you pick that as your starting walker, you just take three of your color population cubes, and you'd put them on Gaia. And then your starting airship is one, and probably, I mean, this will later be replaced by a little, like, airship symbol. Um, this is not how many airships you start with. I'm probably going to say every air sh every walker starts with one, and you can later buy or, you know, build more. Um, this determines your airship movement range, or speed, I guess, each turn. 
if you want to move your airship. Um, Gaia has shitty airships because they just they don't have the technology to really make them good. Whereas uh, Icarus has a starting airship speed of three, like they have the best around. And so if you start on Icarus, your airships can move three spaces every turn. Whereas Gaia, they can just move one. It's very slow. It's tough. Um, and so depending on where you start, you know, your airships get better speed or not. Okay. And then we have the, the lower section is kind of each walker's special trait. And these can be, you know, upsides or downsides or actions or, you know, all sorts of different benefits. And so Gaia's ability as, as a command action, and yeah, we'll talk about that later. A player with at least one population on Gaia may sell or for four gold apiece. And I'm actually going to change this. Um, I'm going to say you can buy or sell or for four gold apiece, which actually, no, that doesn't make any sense. Um, I may, I may have to change, like, this is... I talked about this a little last time, but I really, I, I want to get the whole trading and the buying and selling and all that kind of set. Because I said Gaia has a shit ton of wood. Like, they're all about that, but they don't have any ore. So I want people to come in and be able to buy wood for a certain price and sell ore for a certain price. So I may have to adjust this. So you can sell ore for four gold a piece, or you can buy lumber for maybe two gold a piece or something like that. Um... So if you, I mean, then there's that kind of that whole, you could just become kind of a mogul thing where maybe a victory condition is to have a certain amount of gold and maybe the best way to do that, you could just sit there and collect income, but that might take a long while. You might not win in time. So if you really want to get moving, you can buy a lot of ore at Minos and then transport it over to Gaia and sell it all off. That's kind of where I want to get to. Um, like I want physical space to really matter in the game. Like I want you to actually have to, I don't want it to just be, oh, you collect all this and you can just sell it all wherever you want and just blah, blah, blah. Like I want it to actually be your ore collection is over here. You want to get it over here to sell it. Cause that's where people want it. That's where the money is. Um, I want it to be more spatial than just, oh, I have everything and here you go. Here you go. Like the, the, the space really matters. And so with stuff moving and your airship speed and all that, that really matters. Uh, okay. So then towards the top section of Gaia, you have the population numbers. And so this is where kind of the area control kind of comes into play. How much population you have on a certain walker, you get certain benefits. And these all these all stack. So if you just have two population on Gaia, you just bring two little population cubes over there and you plant them there. You get two lumber every turn. At the start of your turn, you get two lumber. That's your lumber income. If you have three population there, you get an additional two lumber income. So you'd have four then, basically. Um, I don't know if that's the best way to represent it. I could change it to just, no, because it has to be that way. Because then you'd have to keep relisting it. Which with icons, maybe it's okay. But right now, I think saying it stacks works. So if you have three population there, which is what you start with, uh, if you start on Gaia, you get four lumber at the start of your turn. And if you have five population, you get four lumber and one gem at the start of your turn. If you have eight population there which is quite a bit i mean let's be honest it's going to be quite a bit uh, you have to really invest in guy then you would get eight lumber at the start of your turn and a gem if you have the majority there which if you have eight you're likely to have the majority there you also get five gold at the start of your turn and so if you really just want to invest in guy you put all your shit there you'd get eight lumber five gold and a gem at the start of your turn so you'd be lumber master but you wouldn't get any ore and so i really want to differentiate that like because people on, in the setting, people on Gaia that live there, they got all the wood they want. They have wood for days, but they're desperately in need of ore. And so they have to, they want to send airships out, or they want people to bring airships to them and, um, you know, sell, sell ore to them. And so that's why if you go, if somebody else comes to Gaia and brings ore over, they could just sell it to the bank and get gold but if they just want lumber if they want a lot of lumber um they can either buy it with gold or you can start trading that's the only way you can get ore for lumber directly is through trading now yes you could just buy or sell ore for gold buy lumber for gold we could do that but i want to encourage trading because maybe you can negotiate a better rate okay so if you have if you as a player have eight people on gaia you get all that shit, and you have the majority, but then somebody else could bring over, and they could put 
five people there. They also get the four lumber every turn and the gem, but they don't get the majority bonus. And so that's where you kind of have a conflict then. Where it's like, that's where you have coups, is what the technical term, I guess, would be. Where it's like, hmm, if I just kill off some of this other person's people, some of this other person's population, you know, knock them down to maybe three people, boom, you know, I have the majority. And then I, I get the thing. But then you have to hold that until the start of your next turn, because you get the incomes at the start of your turn. And so coups could be a, a play. Then we have the little da dash rectangles in the middle section. These are probably going to be removed um, because and my initial thought was there would be spaces on each walker and these would be kind of the upgrade tiles. And so people would have to invest a certain amount of population on there and they would put in a certain number of resources and you can see they're they're kind of heavy like nine gold ten lumber five ore and a gem which you know if you sit on guy with like you know eight population or whatever for a couple turns you're gonna have everything but the ore and so that's kind of the thing with i mean nothing is no walker is an island i guess like no walker is really just going to be self-sufficient like that's kind of, i mean maybe one maybe maybe i'll have one that's self-sufficient but it's not going to be great um, so that's kind of the whole point of the game is you're constantly needing to be moving around and trading and spreading out your population and expanding and stuff like that. But okay, say you get the ore from, you know, somebody bringing it to you and you trade and blah, blah, blah. Because, you know, if you're on Gaia, you might have 30 lumber or something like that, but you might not have a lot of ore. So you want people to come to you and I will give you lumber, many lumber. It's almost Catan-esque, I guess, but it's not Catan. Okay. So say you invest and you build the harvesting plant. Then you get one gold income for every three lumber income that you have. And I may change the numbers a little bit. But this would, just based on guy, if you have eight and you have the majority, you would have eight lumber income. So you'd have basically an extra two gold income. Everything, everything, everything here is just very temporary. It all needs to be play tested. This is me literally just sitting here and going, oh, sure, this sounds good. Um, so that might need to be expanded because two gold income might not be very big. It might be two gold income for every three or something like that, or one for every two. Um, okay, and so then as long as you have the population sitting there on that harvesting plant and you've paid the resource good, it's, it's, I think it's just going to be a one-time pay for the resources, but your population is going to sit there. Um, you get that benefit. You have it. And the other one, Elven Longbows. You have to put four population there. And these numbers, again, they might might change. 12 gold, 12 lumber, 2 ore. And you get Elven Longbows. And as long as you have that, you are in control of that spot, um, you can perform a first attack without a counterattack. And so this is across everything. All your all your population, all your walkers, every, it's, it's kind of universal. Um, which... This, that's more of a mechanic thing than just a theme thing, but we assume you kind of disseminate it about. And so that kind of, that the Elven Longbows is kind of into the attacking part, which I'll talk about a little later, where I, again, I was just like, oh, this sounds good. No counterattack for the first attack, sure. Without really thinking about how the combat system is going to work. But I assumed there would be kind of multi-rounds in kind of a coup attempt. And so for the first one, since you're firing with your longbows before they can get in close, uh, you don't have a counterattack. But, as I said, I'm going to remove this from the walker, I think, because uh, when I first put up the video, Ren messaged me on Skype with his kind of thoughts and ideas. And the one thing that he mentioned was each walker would have like a little stack of cards related to that walker. And at first, I was really hesitant about that because I was like, do I really, does this game need cards and do I want cards? Does cards just kind of be like, oh, it's a Meritrash. We got to have cards. Everybody likes cards. Yes, cards. I'm, the game was going to have cards regardless, but I didn't know how many. And it was like, do I want a little stack for each walker? And I was like, I don't, if I can do the game without cards, I'd rather not. But now I think it's better because it really would slim down the actual walker tiles themselves. They'd be a lot less cluttered. And so the, I think five or six is the number I'm looking for right now for each walker. So five or six cards for each walker. And these are going to be stuff like the harvesting plant, like the Elven Longbows. You know, these are going to be upgrades that are themed around each walker. And 
there'll also be like one shot abilities. And I don't know what these will be. <laughs> this is going to be like, you know, a year's worth of just thinking about and really getting in depth with each walker and be like, what ability would this walker really have? And there might be some overlap, like each walker might have a certain thing. Um, and so these are going to be pretty much exactly what, like I just said, but instead of the population just being on that little square on the walker tile, they're actually going to be on the card. And so I'm thinking they won't then contribute to the walker population numbers. So say you had eight population on Gaia, but you wanted the harvesting plant. You'd have to take three off and put it onto that card. And so you'd, brought, you'd lose that four lumber bonus unless you brought your population back up. But you'd have the harvesting plant. And so, again, that's a temporary idea because I really need to think about population numbers. You know, how how many of these little cubes do I want out there? How crowded is it going to be? And how easy is it going to be to build up your population? You know, are people going to be sitting on 30 population at some point where it's like, that's 30 little cubes. Now, yeah, they're not all going to be, and there would be no reason to have them all kind of sitting on one. Um, these are going to be all over the board. But, again, these are things I have to think about. Um... So that, that's a temporary idea where they go on the card and they don't count. Um, but then when they're on the card and say you have a harvesting plant and you're collecting this, then somebody else, nobody else can have the harvesting plant on Gaia. Um, they can't, they can't take it as well. They can't utilize it as well. That's just for the player that has invested in it. However, there are two things you can then do. You can launch a coup, I guess. You can attack the, the population that's on that card. And so you can try and kill them off, and then you can invest in it as well. So you kind of just overthrow them, and you take over the card. Or you can launch a sabotage attempt. And this is mostly going to be like a hired, a, a hired card ability. So you're going to like basically generally pay gold. You're going to pay gold for like, you know, it's kind of an under-the-table thing to some third party to sabotage the card and try and like blow it up. Or something like that. Like, just try to, to eliminate it where nobody can utilize it. Um, the Icarus will have a card that lets them do an aerial bombardment, which lets that player use their airships to attempt uh, sabotage attempts. But you can either, so you can either attack them and try and take it over for yourself, or you can sabotage it so it's just gone. It's done. You just take the card and you put it back in the box because it's, it's no longer usable. Which, I don't know if it makes complete thematic sense if i blow up a harvesting plant somebody else could just build a harvesting plant so that's kind of just a i don't know if that's gonna be anything final um, but i do want sabotaging to be kind of a thing where it's just like yeah i have a lot of gold i'm just gonna fuck over people uh okay so yeah that that's gaia icarus uh icarus if you are not aware is the it's basically like a giant flying manta ray, and uh, there's like a city underneath it that has like giant chains that anchor it to the, the bottom of the manta ray. It's completely ridiculous, I know. I don't know how I came up with that shit. Um, but they're very, they're very technologically advanced because the Icarus, Icarus moves around more than anybody else. They have a lot, they have a lot more opportunities to trade with more walkers. And so, because everything else kind of just lumbers around on the ground where this thing's flying all around. So like the first thing that Icarus advanced was their airship technology. So they have pretty much the best starting airships uh, with the speed of three. And so if you, if you start on Icarus, your goal, because you get no, you get no, resource you get gold and that's it um they, they don't get ore they don't get lumber they don't get gems they get none of that so they're really kind of the trading ish ones they well they're the ones that really want to get out there and so icarus moves twice per movement phase and so this is something i'm really i'm really trying to wrap my head around how i want to do this is the movement stuff when it was worker placement Everybody would place all their workers one at a time, blah, 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 until all the workers are placed. And then you'd wipe it all off, and then every walker would move. But now we're going to move over to kind of a 
kind of an action thing where it's like you can have a purchase action, a move action, uh, command action, so on and so forth. And so I'm really trying to think about when do I want to move walkers? If I do it just like, if I have it so it's like one player does a command and a purchase action. And then the next player, and they do a command and a purchase, and then command and purchase, command and purchase, so on and so forth, until everybody's done their actions. And then we do a grand movement phase. That could be something. Um, but it's like when you're playing with six people and you have 12 walkers around, that's a lot of little dice rolling and kind of minute and just, you know, how do you determine order? Like who, which walkers move first? And I, it kind of doesn't matter, but it might matter. Um, if two bump into each other, what happens then? And then it's like, okay, you could just do it. You do a command action and a purchase action. And then you pick one walker to move. But then it's just like some walkers could just sit there immobile the entire game because nobody cares about them. And it's just like, I don't want players to really be in control of which walkers move and when. So I don't know. I really have to think about walker movement, but that's not a huge concern right now. So Icarus gets to move twice. I, I, well, I mean, that again, that's temporary. It's just they they are going to get to move quicker or more often than other walkers because it's not really a walker at all. Um, and you also cannot launch ground missions from Icarus. This is more thematic than mechanical, I guess. Because um, mechanical, I'm sure people are going to be like, well, why can't I? You know, why can every other walker do it? And why can't, well, you know, and I mean... It's more of a setting thing. Like, people on Icarus just didn't do that. They they didn't launch ground missions because that was kind of beneath them, literally. Like, people on Icarus are very elitist in the setting because they're above literally everybody else. Like, nobody is above the people of Icarus. And so they kind of just look down and like, oh, yeah. And so they have no reason to go down on the ground and explore. And so I have not figured out how ground missions are exactly going to work. Um, based on, you know, when you're on your, a walker, I think as a command action, you'll be able to invest into a ground mission into one of the tiles surrounding the walker. And, um, based on the type of terrain that you go to, whether it be forest or mountains or water, whatever you'll, I, there'll be a deck of cards that'll have like an event and there'll probably be some dice rolls. And this will be, depending on how much you put, invest into the ground mission, you have a higher chance of succeeding, but you still, there's a potential to lose it all. Because the ground, like, I want to make it a point that the ground is terrifying for a reason. And so there might be a, a victory condition to succeed on a certain number of ground missions or something like that. Um, but that's not easy. Like, people are actually going to be start out with, oh, I'm going to launch ground missions. Yeah, let's do it. Like, that just does not happen. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be terrifying, but the rewards may potentially outweigh the risk. Uh, yeah, so Icarus is, uh, gets gold income, bunch of gold income. Uh, they also get combat strength. And uh, the, if you have the majority bonus, you get an extra airship movement. So technically, if you start on Icarus, your airships can move four at a time, which will get you pretty much anywhere you want to go which is the point and their upgrades as of right now again there's going to be a bunch more of these uh, they have experimental experimental weaponry and i think when we have cards every card is going to have its own artwork um because that's what you got to have it's a meritrad it's got to have art um which is going to be just a shit ton of art it's not going to be nearly as good as all the walker art pieces it'll just be kind of minor stuff but the artwork for the experimental weaponry will probably be like some rudimentary guns because that, that's what it is in the setting, is they're like one of the only walkers that have guns. And so that gives you plus two combat strength, which is pretty good. Uh, especially if you have four population on there, that's that's you're you're gonna you're gonna be combat ready. And then they have the aerial bombardment, which, which I mentioned, which lets airships launch sabotage attempts. Um, and the artwork will just be like men on an airship just like pushing over like explosive barrels. Uh, okay, and then finally Minos. And Minos is the, uh, it's basically the giant walking mountain. It's like a giant walking mountain, but on its, like, stomach or where its kind of, like, chin would be, uh, there's, like, a giant blast furnace. 
And so in the setting, Minos is mostly populated by dwarves. Um, and they do all their mining. And so this is like the com- this is the counter to Gaia. Um, and so it has basically the reverse effect of Gaia where you can sell lumber and you'll be able to buy ore. And its population benefits are ore and gold, basically. Uh, if you have seven population, you get a eight ore income. But at four population, you get gold. Um... And if you have the majority, you get two gold and an ore. Surprisingly, there's no gems on Minos. And I might change that, but I might not. Because I might say that the gems have all been farmed. But probably not. I'm probably going to change that. There will probably be some card. And in fact, there is the transform ore ability. Which is 10 gold, 8 ore, 3 population. And as a command action on Minos, you can convert 3 ore into 1 gem. Now it's a command action, so that's kind of limited. Um, there aren't you're not just gonna be able to do command action, command action, you know, blah 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 blah. So that's gonna be a kind of a conscientious effort. But gems are gonna be pretty much the most valuable thing in the game. They're gonna be pretty useful. And that's why for like the aerial bombardment ability, I'll probably change this. Everything's gonna change, whatever. Uh, that costs six gems, which might be kind of extreme, but there will be some walkers where gems are not plentiful, but They'll be there. Um, and then the other Minos ability that I came up with that I don't know if it's really useful at all. Uh, it's just kind of a ridiculous ability, but I was like, this is so freaking cool. I have to put it in. <laughs> uh, Scorched Earth. Uh, it's just two population. You pay eight gold, and as a command action, you can spend five ore to permanently destroy the current world tile that you're on. And you'll just flip it over to like its empty side. And so... I mean, you could just have somebody riding on Minos and just destroying the entire board for really no reason other than just being a dick. Um, again, I don't know how that viable this will be, if it'll be have any use, but I just love it thematically so much that I want to just I want to leave it in there for now. Okay, so that's where I'm at right now with the whole kind of population thing. There's a lot of work to be done. There's so much work. I don't even know when I'm going to have a working prototype that we can actually start testing. Um, I have a lot of walkers to still do. Um, if I look at my list here, I have... We have Olympus. We have um, the question mark walker, which I don't really have a name yet. I named it earlier in the test document, but that has to change. Um, actually, I named it Riley. Because that's unique. Um, and that was kind of the dead walker, which was the, the victim of the nightmare. And the nightmare is going to be for an expansion. That's not going to be in the base game. There's Lagos, which is the really... That's really the trade one. That's the really populated trade one. So they're not going to have any... They're not going to have any like resource increase either. But they're going to be all about trading. So Icarus and Lagos are going to be really want to work together. Um... There's Nautilus, which is the the kind of the whale walker, which is only going to work on water. I don't know how that's going to actually work because water is going to be kind of a random tile that comes up in the board building. So maybe I'll leave that one out until expansion. Um, Medina, which was the desert one where there's really no water. Um, they don't have many resources either. Um, they might be more of the isolationist one. Uh, Moloch. That one has a lot of ore, no lumber. Uh, Sakura was the small one that had the like razor thin cherry blossom, uh, or the razor sharp cherry blossom trees. So they might be really the combat strength one. Um, I don't know how I'm gonna work that into the mechanics, but like if you can successfully harvest the trees and utilize them properly, your combat strength could be amazing. But you know, there's really nothing else there. Um, Astaroth was the... That was the... Basically, like, the very typical medieval one. So I think they'll be very balanced. They'll have the ore and the lumber and gold, and they'll just kind of all be... That'll be the very balanced one. Um, Vermeer was the... That was the kind of the abandoned... Well, not the abandoned one, but the... The unpopulated one. Um, like there was, there was no people there. Well, there were some 
humanoid creatures there, but they were basically in hiding. It was very kind of like pitch black. They were in hiding because at every night, these creatures would come out and just ravage everything. Uh, it was very pitch black. But the... Um, the resources there were incredible. Like that would probably, that's probably what I might do is I, it might be have like a lot of gems, like big gem income. But at the start of your turn, if you had any population on there, you'd have to roll, you'd have to draw like a ground, uh, ground mission card. Because like th th that walker is almost just as dangerous as being on the ground. And then there's Meridium, which is the, that was the turtle one, which very heavily featured in my little mini campaign. So that was where they, they ran like the games, like the Hunger Games, the, the arenas at the top of the shell, and it had the class systems. I don't know really how I'm going to do that. They didn't really have many resources themselves, but they did utilize the shell a lot for like defensive measures. So one of the cards in there might be, you know, shell armor, which will give you a bonus for being attacked or anything like that, or um, for running ground missions and stuff like that. Uh, they, they did utilize a lot of ground missions on that one. Um, that's pretty much where I'm at uh, for walkers. That's my walker design document. I, I kind of stopped developing it for a while, um, and I'm sure I will pick back up. So if you have any ideas for walkers, I'd always love to hear them. I can't guarantee I'll use them, but I, of course I'd love to hear them. If you have any suggestions about the game itself, I am all ears. I'm definitely taking anything and everything into consideration. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I like where it's going. I like where it's headed. I'm just, my concern, I guess, at this point, my main concern is, is there enough game here, you know? I Like, is there enough game here to justify lasting, like, two hours? Um, and there's really no way for me to know that until we get to testing, but... I'm just going to keep plugging along, fleshing out all the walkers, starting on their abilities and cards and stuff like that, and eventually we'll we'll get to it. All right, well, uh, thank you for listening, watching the first uh, designer diary for Otbog TBG, and I'll try to do one of these like every week or so if, if I can. But uh, yeah, I will uh, see you fine folks around.